uh, for Sophie, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining because, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you, you're taking some time to come here today and I'm going to do my best to give you as much as possible in terms of things that you can go and action afterwards. Um, and I'm just curious actually, of the people in the room, I'm going to talk and I'm going to say you quite a lot, you as the leader. Um, but in the room, have we got managers, team leaders, deputies, just quick pop your hand up, um, owners, operators, directors, area managers, okay so a really good mixture. So that's great. Now I will say you quite a lot and when I say you, think about you and also think about the people that you work with as well that may be team leaders, managers, etc. So what are we going to do today? I'll do a really brief introduction to me for anybody that doesn't know kind of who I am, what we do um, and then I'm going to get stuck in and just kind of deliver as much as possible for you really. So the Judgment Index is a short online assessment that's used to measure value-based behaviours. So our care clients use this as part of their recruitment strategy, appraisals, inductions, developing staff, and I'm going to refer to some research that we've done with the Judgment Index shortly, so that's why I just wanted to explain a little bit about what that was. Um, what do we know about leadership? Well, we wrote the book on it. So we wrote a book called The Care Leader's Handbook, it's based on leadership workshops and academies that we deliver. And you can grab a copy if you want. Our stand is just out, straight outside the back door, um, just to the left-hand side. So feel free to come and see us afterwards. And if you do happen to recognize my voice, even though it's retired slightly, I did used to host a podcast that was the first social care podcast called The Road to Outstanding. And you can still go back and listen to all 60 episodes, depending where you get your podcast from. So let's jump into what we're going to go into today. And really, it all boils down to leadership. Yes, I'm going to be talking about how you can build great culture, but leadership really is at the heart of that. Now, I have got a QR code on the screen, and it will go on again at the end of the talk, so don't worry if you can't get your phone out quickly enough. Um, and if you pop your email address in, you'll receive the slides, and I'm recording the talk as well. But what I'm going to cover today, before we actually get into the culture strategies, is leading yourself and leading others. And then I'm going to give you a roadmap to developing great culture within your team. So, I think it's fair to say that great culture cannot thrive without great leadership. But, what does great leadership actually look like? And what I'm going to ask you to do a lot today is think about yourself. Think about where you are when I'm talking about some of the things that I'm going to go through today. How effective are you in these areas that I talk about? Well, as a bit of a benchmark for what great leaders look like, we did some research uh, probably in 2017, quite a few years ago, and that was the largest study of outstanding rated managers that's, that's happened within the care sector. And what we found is that there were key, some key dif differentiators between those outstanding managers and other managers within the sector. And what I'm going to refer to today is going to be the Judgment Index results, but you will get a link to that research. So if you want to go and read the full, the full study and understand more about that, you can. But there were some really key things that we found that great leaders, outstanding managers within this sector led themselves first and foremost. So what does that mean? What does that look like? I'm just gonna pick up on two things within this research. So you can, you can read some of the key points that we have here. But one of the things that we found with outstanding rated managers is that their focus when it came to people when it came to task and when it came to big picture thinking, so thinking strategically, were all very balanced. So why is that important? Well, it meant that they're able to think about the people, whether that's the, their staff or the people that they're working with or the people that they're supporting. They were also able to think about the task, so the job that needs to be done. And they're also able to think strategically. What's over the horizon? What's beyond the horizon? Now thinking about you perhaps, or the people around you, how many people do you know 
leaders, managers, are too task focused, too much focused on this is what needs to be done, this is what needs to happen, here's the list of things we need to do today. And do people kind of fall down the agenda slightly? Does that big picture thinking fall down the agenda slightly? And this is what we find with a lot of people within this sector. And maybe that is an issue with the sector. For anyone who was here for the last talk, it got a little bit fiery with the fact that there's so much compliance, um, legislation, etc. that actually the job is, is very task focused if you're a leader. But how can you regain some of that balance? So have a little think about that because we're going to come back to something similar later. And the other thing that I really want to pick out on this, these sort of key findings is the well-being of these outstanding rating managers. Now, well-being, what is it? This is a sort of big question. We're hearing well-being all the time. Everybody's talking about it. What does it mean? Well, for the purposes of this research, it's not about health, fitness. It's not about... Um, you know, going to the gym, eating healthy. We don't measure that in an online assessment. But what we do measure is things like self-esteem and self-confidence, the ability to handle stress, assertiveness, the ability to be able to stand up and, and speak up for yourself. And also things like self-criticism, so how critical somebody is on themselves. And what we found is that these outstanding rated managers they were really good in those areas. They had good self-confidence, they weren't too self-critical. Yes, they wanted to push themselves to be outstanding, but they didn't beat themselves up over it. And how I describe this, and how I describe well-being when I'm trying to sort of paint a picture of what well-being is, is that these managers had a solid foundation of self. They were comfortable in who they were. They were in a good place. And when you're in a good place, and when you have a solid foundation, you can bring your best self to work. You can perform at your best. And I've got a little model to describe what that looks like. So if you're going back into your organization and you're trying to explain well-being to your team or whoever it is that you're having a conversation with, um, I'm gonna paint the picture and bring this to life for you now. So, on the left, you can see a wedding cake. I know it's not the most glamorous wedding cake in the world, but this is how I'm gonna describe it. And what you can see with this wedding cake, and what we found with these outstanding rated managers is that their foundation of self was strong. It was a solid platform that could then support the work side. Is this making sense to everybody, the, the picture? So what you find, and what you literally find with, with a cake is that when you have that solid foundation, you can get more out of work. Who, who here relates to this? When you're in a good place, when you feel comfortable in yourself, when you feel confident, yeah? When you've got good energy, when you take time for yourself outside of work, when you fulfill yourself outside of work, you can actually get more out of work as a result. I'll take a step to the side for people taking photos. But what we see with not just managers, not just leaders, but across the care sector as a whole, most people's wedding cake would look like this one on the right hand side. That foundation is not solid. People aren't confident. People are very self-critical. People don't do a lot for themselves outside of work to fulfill themselves. And therefore, that work side is sitting on quite a wobbly foundation. So in terms of the cake, what happens when you are on a wobbly foundation? You can tip over. It can collapse. And so I'd like you to have a little think about yourself right now or your immediate team around you. What would your wedding cake look like if you had to draw it out? Obviously, we've, we've done this in a sort of scientific measurement, but what would it look like? Maybe you're going to scribble down a little picture of what yours would look like now. And what I'm going to ask you to do at, at various sections across this talk today, if you have a little bit of space on a piece of paper or even if you just think about it in your own mind, when it comes to well-being and when it comes to leading yourself, what would a 10 out of 10 look like? So if you were 10 out of 10 for leading yourself, what would that look like? Would it look like switching your laptop off on a Friday night? Would it look like going and doing something that you used to really enjoy when you were younger, whether that's horse riding, golf, painting, whatever it is. Is that what a 10 out of 10 would look like for you? 
And if so, once you have that image of 10 out of 10, where are you now? What number would you give yourself now? How big is that gap? And I want everyone to just take that for themselves and have a little think. So, we talked about leading yourself, and again, before we get into the culture, I want to talk about leading others. Because you can't lead yourself, you can't lead a great culture without leading yourself, and you also can't lead a great culture unless you know how to lead others effectively. And the thing that I see as a mistake over and over again when I go and work with care companies is that people lead by preference. This is how I like to lead, and so therefore this is how I'm going to lead my team. And if there's one lesson when it comes to leading others is that it's not about you. It's about what you want to get from the people that you are leading. How can you lead them more effectively? And that might not be your preference, but that might be what works for them. If you always lead the same way and lead everyone exactly the same way, you will probably only get about 20% of your team that will engage with you in that way. So how can we lead more effectively? So I'm going to share with you a model. This is, um, this is in our book, so you can, you can go and reference this more. Um, but I'm going to explain it to you now, and obviously if you do scan the QR code, you will get the slides afterwards, so you'll be able to look at this model in a little bit more detail. But let's start with a scenario first, so that I can bring this to life. So hopefully you can read the writing. I've got two scenarios. On the left, we have an example of do this, do that. This is what we call a tell style of communication. And then on the right, make sure I get my left and right, we've got go for it. The leader that's saying go, empower. And this is an empowering style of communication. So we've got the two different styles. Where do you think most people sit? How do you think you lead? What about the people around you? How are they leading? more of a tell or more of an empower? I think we would like to empower, but I think the reality that is that most of us tell. So if you're in a, in a service, in an organization, and you're a manager, you probably find that you're telling people what to do. Maybe not in this way, maybe not saying do this, do that, but you're probably telling people what to do more than you are saying, yeah, go, crack on. And there's pros and cons to that. So the benefit of the tell style of communication is that it gets things done. And it normally gets things done quite quickly. And it also means that things get done in the way that they should be done as well. And let's face it, this is an industry where there is a lot of risk, there is a lot of compliance, and we can't afford for mistakes to happen in certain situations. But using a tell style of communication constantly with your team is also going to have its downsides. If you have a skilled, motivated team and they're constantly being told what to do, they're going to start to feel disengaged. They're going to start to feel disempowered. They're going to feel demotivated. And it can have an impact on their confidence. And it also keeps you busy because you can't, lead, you can't trust people to do things for themselves. So, do we want to move to a more empowered style of communication? Is it always right to empower everyone? Should that be the goal? And if it is, how do we start to get there? Well, I'm going to share a model with you now that you can use when you go back or you can start to think about it right now about how you can effectively communicate with people. So, what we have on the screen here, let me walk you through this. So we have the tell style of communication over on the left hand side, and we have the empowered style of communication over on the right hand side. Now a consideration that we need to have with our teams or individuals is what's their skill set, what's their knowledge, and what's their motivation. So these are the considerations. And then I'm actually going to ignore the two in the middle, sell and discuss, just because of time for today. Um, but maybe we'll, we'll find some time, another time to, to go through those. And then as you can see here, we have this spread of ownership and responsibility. So this is your, your team, um, the individuals. This is their perceived 
ownership and responsibility. So, how this model works is when you have that tell style of communication, you know, when you have a situation and you say to somebody, right, you need to go and do this, you need to go and do that, this is how it's done, this is how I want you to do it. The ownership and responsibility is quite low. That individual or that team, they don't feel like they really own what they're doing. They don't really feel like they've been given responsibility. But that can be very effective and very useful if you have a team of people who are not highly skilled, who aren't that motivated. If you walk into a team and they're really unmotivated and you say, hey everyone, go and do this however you like. Do you think it will get done at the end of the day? <laughs> probably not. So we probably don't want to empower people who aren't skilled, who don't have the knowledge. And actually, if we do try to empower people who don't have the knowledge, what can happen then? They feel nervous. They don't really know what they're doing. They, they can actually become even less confident. But if you have a team, and if you think about your team right now, if you have a team of highly motivated individuals who have been in this business for a long time, who know what they're doing, who are comfortable, then you may be able to start to move to a more empowered style of communication. And that is going to support them because they are going to feel like they're trusted, they're going to feel like they have responsibility and they are going to take ownership. And all of this is going to help you to build that great culture. Who's ever worked with somebody that just told them what to do constantly, even if you knew what to do? Yeah. And how did that make you feel? Not great. So, yes, it would be ideal if we could move towards this empowered style of communication, but it's not right for everyone. And I think that this is something that I say that sometimes raises a few eyebrows because we hear all the time, empower, empower, empower the staff. It's not always right to empower the staff, but it's for you to understand this style and this model to know who you can empower, who you need to tell, what teams are going to be, you know, able to be given that, that, um, that empowerment and that responsibility. Because ultimately, we do want to move that way. That frees the leaders up to do what they need to do, to, to do strategy, to do other things. It takes time, but I am going to walk you through a roadmap that will take you there. But I think it is fair to say that the tell style of communication does not lead to a great culture but too many of us are stuck in this, in this style. So I'd like you to have a think about yourself, as I asked you to do earlier, and think about how do you lead others? How effectively do you lead others? And what would a 10 out of 10 look like? And if a 10 out of 10 is, I adapt my style, I, I know who to empower, I know who I have to tell, and if that's a 10 out of 10 for you, where are you now? Or do you get stuck in that style of, yep, yeah, you do this, yep, yeah, you do that. Have a little think. What's a 10 out of 10? Where are you now? Give that a number. Because at the end of today, you're going to be able to understand where your gaps are. Do I need to lead myself better? Do I need to lead others more effectively? So let's move on now to leading a great culture. And I'm going to walk you through a strategy. And this is literally step by step, so I'm going to be quite prescriptive about it. Um, but this is a roadmap that you can get results from within 30 days. And I say that from experience because we have a care company that we worked with that followed this roadmap step by step. And within 30 days, other people, family, residents, uh, doc visiting doctors commented, what's happened here? What has changed? There was a massive, massive shift in culture. But what I will guarantee, I don't know how many people are in the room, I'm not very good at guessing, let's say there's 100. I am probably going to guess that less than 10% of you are actually going to go and take action out of this talk. So this is my challenge for you, to go and take action after. Because this really will work, and it's not rocket science. So, let's go through it. I've got a few, I've got a few more slides to go through. So, the first step is to understand exactly where you are now. Where is the culture issue within your home, within your organization? 
is it one of the things that we can see on the screen right now? So go away and sit down for yourself and have a brainstorm. Do you have a clicky culture? Is it really difficult for new people to integrate? Do you have a blame culture? Are people scared to make decisions because they're worried that they're going to get blamed if something goes wrong? Try and understand what is going on within your service and have a little jot down of your own ideas and then pull your leadership team together and ask them as well. But it doesn't stop there. You also need to engage the staff at this point. And I think the best way to do that is to send an anonymous survey out to them and ask them, do you think we have clicks in this organization? Do you think there is a blame culture? Ask those difficult questions that you probably don't want to read the answers to. Um, but you need to engage with the staff. But not just yes, no questions. If you just ask yes, no questions, all you're going to get is data. So you need to ask them things like, do you ever feel uncomfortable coming into work? Would you ever have anxiety about coming into work? Why? See if you can get whole sentences and decent answers from people because that's going to be your insight, especially if they feel they can be anonymous. So once you've gathered all of that data, review it, you then need to share it back with the team. You need to give them an open forum, whether that's a staff meeting, whether that's kind of multiple little groups of meeting, whether that's sharing that data on a notice board and telling them, this is what we found, we've asked you about the culture, this is what you are saying. And you need to let them have a little vent. Most people do want to have a little vent, but then the venting stops. And the next question needs to be, what culture do we want? And it's really important as a leader yourself, if you're facilitating this meeting, that you don't influence too much. Because what you'll find is that what you think and what you say, other people will start to agree with, but you need to hear it from them. And there needs to be an environment where there is full transparency, no egos, and no inhibitions. If one person speaks up and says, this is how I feel, then that feeling is valid. Um, you know, it can't be dismissed. But once you've got all that stuff out of the way, you need to talk about what culture you want. And if anybody starts to get negative, negative, it needs to be, no, we've, we've finished that now. We're on to the positive stuff. What do we actually want to create in this organization? So when you're looking at these things, I'm sure you're probably thinking, well, we've put out all of them, actually. <laughs> we've really have a culture of well-being and a culture of learning and a culture of self-leadership. Um, so get from the staff the key ones, the key ones that you want to focus on to start off with. And then what you need to do is have another team meeting, perhaps you can do this every day of the week, and you need to create what I call a culture wheel. So I've got five things on this wheel here. You can have six, you can have eight. I would say the bigger service you are, you're free to have more. The smaller service, try and keep it, keep it smaller, keep it down to a few things. This is the culture that we want. And then what you need to take is to take each slice, one by one, well-being. Okay, team, what does a 10 out of 10 look like for well-being? They need to talk about that vision of what a 10 out of 10 is. Okay, well, a 10 out of 10 is this, a 10 out of 10 is that. Great, that's what the 10 out of 10 is. Where are we now? This is the same question that I've asked you twice already today. Where are we now? You can do this by a show of hands. Um, obviously, don't dismiss people. If somebody thinks they're a one and someone thinks they're a 10, you always get those people. Um, they're valid. Pull the, pull the answers together. Overall, we're about a four. OK, so we've got a gap there. That's one section of the wheel done. Move on to the next one. OK, learning. What is a 10 out of 10 for learning? It's this, it's that, it's this. Get somebody to write these things down. These are becoming your culture statements then that you're going to live by going forward. Where are we now? Okay, we're a six out of 10. Right, move on around the wheel. You can take a different one each day of the week. If you don't have, you, we've only got 10 minutes in the morning. Fine, do one at a time every day of the week until you have a full wheel. And when you have that full wheel, you can see where the gaps are and you can start to strategize. How are we going to improve this gap? What are we going to do? And what you're going to do is hand this over to the team. Let them come up with the ideas. It doesn't all sit with you. How are we going to grow this wheel in total, starting with the areas that need the most work? And then the next step is to turn them into culture teams. 
So with a culture team, every single person with the organisation gets a different label, well-being, learning, self-leadership, whatever it is. It needs to be spread. You can't have all the leaders being one team. It needs to be mixed up. And then those people will self-police and those people will start to influence and start to push this culture through. A bit like, you know, if anybody went to a school where you were in houses and you were in that house and then you were proud to be in that house and you, you know, that was your mission. This will be the same for your teams. I'm in the wellbeing team, so actually I've seen this and I'm not happy about it, so what are we gonna do about it? Everyone is taking responsibility. Everyone is taking ownership. The different teams can come up with visuals, mood boards, um, ideas. And this home that we work with that turned the culture around in 30 days, when you walk through that home, there was things up on the walls, there was things with their um, well-being work, you know, well-being, and then there all their ideas underneath it. And the great thing about that is everyone is on board and everybody's moving in the same direction. And change can happen. Yes, you might lose a few people along the way. We had two people resign from this home and I think the manager's words were good riddance because they did not want to change, they did not want to move with the culture and they were best finding work elsewhere. So think about the difference that you can make in these really simple steps. You will have a team who are more empowered, a team that are more confident. It will become the norm for people to self-police to work with each other and say, hey, hang on a sec, what about this? I'm on this culture team. So you really, really can have an impact, but it has to be something that is driven through the organization. Your new team, new staff members coming in, they'll be on board straight away because they don't know any different. And this is what's gonna help you drive a positive culture, drive staff retention, um, and really just build a positive environment for people to work in. Now I said that I predict that 90% of the people in the room will not go forward and take this challenge on. But I'm curious with a little thumbs up if you think that this would be something that would be easy to implement, that doesn't cost anything apart from your time. <laughs> Anybody willing to give it a go? And I'd love to hear from you afterwards if you do. Um, you can lead this um, and it doesn't need to be all the pressure on you. Empower the staff and let them drive this forward. So, right on time, I think. <laughs> um, please feel free to scan, you'll get the slides straight away, um, and I will send you the recording afterwards. And if you have any questions, please come visit me straight outside the exit on the left-hand side. Uh, now, folks, we've also got a bit of slack now, and rather than just have it full of nout, let's fill it with something. Is there anybody would like to ask uh, Sophie a question? Uh, if so, we have Henry there, who's gonna come uh, round. There you go, nice and loud so that we can hear you. Okay, um, how, how do you, if it's a, a startup service with a supported the supported developers in the UK, how do you implement what you've just talked about? So when you're first starting out, it's actually a really good time to get the culture embedded straight away. So what I would actually do, if you haven't created your company values yet, then when you've got your first group of staff, even if it's five, five people, whatever it is, get them to be involved in what the values of the company are. So a bit like we did with those different statements for the culture, what, what are the values that they want to have in this business? But also, who has respect as a value in their company? I'm gonna see loads of hands go up. Every care company's got respect as a value. But what's important is that your staff have a definition of what respect means for them, and they create it, and they therefore own that statement. And that also can help you live by it a lot more as well. If it's just respect, it's like, okay, yeah, respect. That's it. We expect, <laughs> we expect that. But what does it actually mean in practice? Um, so you can you can start to do that with your staff right from day one. Yeah, Henri, we've got a question over there, gentlemen at the front. Thanks, Sophie. Um, Hello. I very much like what I've heard, but I, I'm going to give you an impossible question. <laughs> no matter what you do, no matter what you put in place, no matter what strategies you use, 
matter how many books you read, or how many slides you present, how many conversations, how many meetings, one person 